my gosh. Welcome. Welcome, you guys. It's so good to see you. We've got Dr. Erica in the house, and we have Sam White. And we are sorely missing Sherry Woodard out in New Mexico, surviving yet another storm. They seem to follow her, don't they? <laughs> yeah. So, At least she's so not in Mississippi I, this time. Is she what, honey? At least she's not in Mississippi this time. Exactly, exactly. And I was thinking today, she and I met at Hurricane Katrina. Yep. You know, this is practically the anniversary of that. But then she goes to Florida, and now they're following her into New Mexico. Yep. So yeah, so that that is our missing our missing partner here, Sherry Woodard of Partners for People in New Mexico. Uh, we love you, sweetheart, and see you next time. So um, we've got Sam Wyke, who we love and adore, who gets us lots of views on Facebook and YouTube, and uh, we just love sharing his videos and um, the viewpoints. So we love you, Sam. Thank you. Can you tell us while we're here? Tell us a little bit about the inner dog and what you do. Uh, most of my work is with moderate to severely afflicted uh, dogs behaviorally. I do a lot of bite cases, a lot of reactive cases, all based, all fear-based cases. Um, so it, it it's a lot of work. It's a lot of commitment by the, the pet owner. Uh, we work a lot with veterinary behaviors from UPenn uh, from the various veterinary behaviors here in the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area. And the idea is, you know, trying to make positive change so the dog has the best quality of life. And with that said, sometimes, it, you know, it just doesn't work out. But, you know, we, we put every forward before we have to go to some other, um, whether it's rehoming or behavioral euthanasia or whatever. I don't know why the camera's doing that. I can't tell you. <laughs> well, right. a lot of this is going to be on our podcast too, I Animals no Inside idea. Out, our podcast. So people won't know what we're laughing about. Um, and we're talking about such such serious situations, but Sam keeps coming, coming closer, like he's on wheels, coming closer to the camera and then going further back. So... And Sam is now experiencing a storm where he is. So who knows? We might lose him. We lost Meg's audio earlier. And yeah, who knows? So Sam, I, I love and adore your work. And you are, you know, sometimes we've got to call it what it is. And, and often it is. It's the last house on the block. Mm -hmm. You. Yeah, yeah. I know. It is it is that serious. I'm lucky. I've had a lot of great mentors. You know, I'm part of a, a great organization, the Professional Guild. I'm one of Victoria Stillwell's licensed and endorsed trainers. You know, Sherry and I go back, I don't even know, 15 years, I guess. Um, I just found out that Dr. Eric and I have uh, mutual acquaintances and that we'll actually be kind of working together in a roundabout way doing stuff. So it's pretty cool. Way cool. Way cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's for me, it's it's like the people, you know, it's the cream rising to the top. So, um, you know, and then we get to get to meet and intermingle. So speaking of which, here's Dr. Erica. And um, we're so glad to have you here. And tell us a little bit seriously, seriously. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and why you love it. Sounds good. Uh, well, thanks for having me. It's fun to fun to chat with both of you. And it was great uh, finding out the connections that uh, Sam and I have already. So that's really, really great. Um, so I'm currently an associate professor at Virginia Tech. I teach in animal and poultry science, but my focus is on applied animal behavior and welfare. Uh, most of my work has been in dogs, although we've done a little work. Uh, we're, we're working now with equines and, and we even had a paper come out with some um, cattle on some habituation and handling. So um, my background is I, I got into dog training um, because I <laughs> bought myself a, a German Shepherd from Working Lines when I graduated from college and I needed to keep up with her. So uh, I had to get behavioral help and I took her into competitive agility and just loved it. Um, my agility instructor is fabulous and a ton of fun and, and I just really fell in love with training and behavior. Um, so I went back to, I, well, I became a professional dog trainer, worked at, in shelters for a little while, 
um, worked as a program manager at a doggy daycare in California, um, and then uh, wanted to go back to grad school. So I went back at University of North Texas with Jesus Rosales Ruiz, uh, where I earned my master's. Wow. Uh, and that was just a you know an eye-opening wow. experience, <laughs> and I and I really loved that program. Uh, and then by the time I graduated, uh, I was lucky enough that Clive Wynn had his lab, his dog lab going at University of Florida. So I did my PhD there, mostly looking at uh, human human interactions and really asking why dogs like to be with us and how we can be better for them and what we can use for reinforcers for dogs and how to improve their behavior. Um, and so that, and along the way, I became a board certified behavior analyst while I was there. Uh, and then I moved on after I graduated, I was at Carroll College as an assistant professor and ran the dog behavior program out there where students fostered dogs for a year, um, really great. And I became a certified applied animal behaviorist while I was there. And about four years ago, I moved to tech because um, I really love doing research and this gives me more opportunity for research. So. Out here, um, I mentioned a little bit briefly that that we're really into applied animal work, mostly with horses and equine. Sorry, horses and dogs. <laughs> Get my equines and canines going. Uh, although we're really open to all species, we love we love all animal behavior. Um, so we do a lot of work on looking at how dogs learn, how how best to train them. A lot of shelter dog welfare research with uh, Dr. Lisa Gunter and Clive Wynn at Arizona State. Um, we're working on some different equine projects. Uh, and you know, teach classes in applied animal behavior, try to get students aware of, of uh, positive reinforcement and force-free force -free training. Um, and then we just last year, because I didn't have enough on my plate, we started an online master's program in applied animal behavior and welfare to try and um, you know, really push our field forward. So one of my, one of my goals is to elevate our field um, and make sure that the people that are practicing um, have the knowledge of skills that they need to do well by the animals. Well, you know, you, you really, I mean, obviously you got a pretty boring life. I mean, we're, we're really <laughs> downtime. Um, the, the, envy, the envy of everyone, everyone listening, honestly, honestly. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit more. I didn't hear all that about the master's program. Where did you uh, get your master's? Um, master's at University of North Texas, um, mm -hmm. and that was with Dr. Jesus Rosales Ruiz. Um, mm -hmm. I actually met him at a clicker expo and found out he had that master's program, and I had been poring over the internet looking for programs that would fit for me, and none of them were quite right until I found his, his program, um, and that was really great. Because it literally made sense to you, right? Made sense to you and yeah. what you wanted to do? Yeah, and I, you know, when I was reading, um, you know, when I was training my shepherd, and I loved reading all the books, but I just, you just kept coming up against all these questions of like, well, do we know that? Um, how, is this the right way to do it? Is this the best way to do it? And uh, so I thought, you know, the best way to do that is to try and go back and, and answer those questions um, since they haven't been answered for, for dogs. Um, so really, you know, turning dog training into a science. Well, what, so when, when I knew that you were coming on, I started reading up all about you. And I have read your most recent research papers. I mean, really, I printed out, I printed out what was on your website uh, that um, uh, five pages, it's five pages of your research. And, you know, just listing the titles and where I could find them. So what I did was I started with the most recent first. And what I found was, uh, you know, and this is, again, something that Sam and I have talked about many, many times. I think the whole world is talking about it now because it is, you know, it's separation anxiety. And what there's many, many different words and spins that we can put on it. But it is uh, it is worry created by being separated. And, and I, I, I know that's too simple, but not really. And so what, I, what I'd like to say today and what I'd like to, us to talk about, separation anxiety, yours, mine, and ours. And I think that it's not only for canines and equines. Whoa, we know about that partnership that they form with each other uh, and hopefully with us somewhere along the line. But, but for me, it's about also the human relationships. And, you know, let's talk about, you know, being separated from our loved ones. So this is, this is really tough. So 
the separation anxiety, yours, mine, and ours. And maybe just to kick it off and, um, you know, I'll ask Erica first and then Sam, defining the problem, creating solutions. And Erica, kick us off. What do you, what do you think about? <laughs> yeah, this is... We? Yeah, it's a challenging problem. And I'll, I'll just mention when you're talking about the variety of animals that show this, uh, one of my students at Carroll, she uh, had a lot of fish. She um, had a whole bunch of beta fish and she would um, report that her beta fish would engage in certain behaviors when she was absent too. So mm -hmm. even those fish mm -hmm. seem to be aware of, you know, the relationship they built with her and they might do some more, um, you know, different swimming patterns or things like that when she mm -hmm. was absent or been gone for a while. So. Um, I love doing that. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, you know, I think this, like you said, all of the species we're talking about um, have formed a relationship with another being, um, and most of this, the species that that we have partnerships with are social. Um, we are equines are canines are, um, and so that relationship is is really essential to them and can be um, you know really powerful and very distressing when you don't get to be with that person or that animal. I mean, I, I feel like, well, I know I have separation anxiety from my own animals. I, that's the worst part. I love traveling, but that's the worst part because I just want them with me all the time <laughs> and going to work is hard. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we, we all experience that. And when it becomes problematic, of course, is when it's distressing for the person or animal experiencing it. And, uh, and then when that, um, comes out in inappropriate behavioral patterns that really impact the the welfare of both the animal and the human that's that's living with them it um, can create a lot of, of stress i i think other than aggression towards household members this is the most challenging problem because you can't avoid it right we all have to leave our homes at some point so you can't say well i'm just not going to introduce my dog to strangers if he doesn't like strangers um we we all have to depart our homes at some point. And so teaching our animals how to how to handle that is really essential. Um, so I don't know if I've defined, <laughs> defined the problem. It's a big category. Um, a number of researchers like Danny Mills in England are looking at whether there are subcategories of, of this issue, you know, that there might be different causes, uh, um, sort of different etiologies of the issue, and whether that I think the important part is whether that speaks to different prevention strategies or different treatment strategies. And, and we're not quite there yet, but I think that's where we're headed is trying to take this large category of behavioral issues and see if there there's some other smaller pieces to it that can help us um, uh, more effectively help our animals either prevent them from developing it or treating Beautiful. it once. Beautiful. Uh, Excellent. Thank you. Sam, what do you what do you find or what are you finding now? Is it any different than when you first started working in home with the um, yeah. you know, I know we're gonna have problems as well, maybe hopefully, as things return to some semblance of normality. Uh, norm yeah, with uh, you know, because of the COVID and everything else. <clears throat> it's interesting, Doctor, when you're saying it, um, you know, I see there's times I'm getting called on four or five month old dogs who are having severe, severe separation anxiety. And to the point that when they're somebody in the family that they picked as their primary person, uh, when that person is home, because the dog has been so stressed out while that person was away, they will actually then guard that person from the other family members. And with some of the the vet behaviors that I work with, we have this discussion, you know, at four or five months old, are we seeing a genetic issue? Mm -hmm. You know, are we seeing uh, an issue that occurred you know, in that first eight to 10 weeks before they were adopted, acquired in whatever way? Um, it, it's just, it becomes so complex and <clears throat> I have I have not found a single strategy that I can use, let's say 50% of the time, 30% of the time to whatever to begin to combat this because you literally have to break this down to the individual dog, to the individual home that it's in, to the individuals that are in the home. Um, 
it, there's just so many things involved. And I have to tell you, years ago, I had an extreme case of an English Mastiff that would, when the people left for work, that would actually go through a second story window, glass, screen, frame and all, onto the roof, down to the ground, trying to get out of the yard to chase the people. The interesting thing on this was, and this was a flyer because I didn't know back then anything about this, was the fact that they had a couple horses on the property. So we actually built a an enclosure right next to the horse paddock. And when they would go to work, this dog would go into this. It was a huge enclosure. I mean, this thing was, what, 40 yards by 40 yards. And it would right up against the horse paddock. The dog was fine. He and the horses, that, that's what he needed. He needed that. But yet there's many people sitting there saying, what should I buy another dog? That's not generally what's going to help it. We don't know until we really break it down what's going to help it. So creating the solutions becomes a real mystery. Yeah, I think the what you mentioned about the puppy showing that, um, there's always sort of you know, some training lore that it was a, a shelter dog issue. And there's plenty of research that shows that dogs that have, you know, come straight from the breeder over 50% show this problem behavior. So, um, you know, it's just pervasive. I think, you know, when we get social species like this and um, form these lovely relationships, then um, we also have to teach them, you know, the skills to, to deal with us being absent too. And that can be, that can be really hard. Completely, completely agree. And so what maybe for the for the people that are listening and the people that do want to learn, when I we we just put up a banner that says, understand your canines behaviors. And so again, what are we looking for? And 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 again, maybe not defining the problem, but how can we separate um and and know how to help? Uh I don't know how else to phrase it. What, Sam? You're scratching your head. What, Sam? No, it, it just, it's funny when you bring this up because I get calls many times, especially with younger dogs. Um, you know, people are like, wow, you know, I left my house and I came home and, and the dog, you know, ripped up the roll of toilet paper and he chewed up, uh, you know, the end of the couch. But when I walked in, he was sound asleep. Does he have separation anxiety? And trying to help people to find the difference between what may be a, a separation issue versus a boredom issue. Mm, good one. It's, it's difficult. So I'm a huge proponent of people putting cameras in so that they can view it, you know, and then the next time I meet with them or we meet virtually whatever, so I get a chance to see what's going on. Uh, because many times with dogs, yeah, they're bored. Especially when you get, you know, that high drive herding dog. I mean, I've had a ton of shepherds in my life. <clears throat> you know, I know what happens when these puppies, they get bored. I know what happen with, happens with my pity when he gets bored, you know, whatever. Versus my my police canine partner. Now, when I left the house, it's not he, that he had separation anxiety. But he didn't do anything except wait by the door for me to come back. I mean, he, you know, no, nobody, I mean, my wife can talk to him, whatever, feed him and everything else, but that's not, you know, him and I went to work together. We came home together. We lived together, whatever. Um, and many times people were like, well, my dog peed while I was gone. Well, how old's your dog? He's five months old. Is he reliably house trained? Well, kind of somewhat. <laughs> Good chance this isn't going to be separation anxiety. But again, this is where having them um, almost keep a journal of these incidents, you know, and if possible video footage really helps when they reach out to a veterinary behaviorist they work out to an applied animal behaviorist you know they, they work, work out to a trainer to say okay here's what i'm seeing so that we they can say to us now what is it and then we can actually look at it and hopefully define it beautiful beautiful erica do you tell tell me what you you know what how how you would want people to view this and what to record and you know how to get uh, maybe the human factor a little bit out of it and just look at the dog. Yeah. Yeah. You're smiling now. What? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, most, most of the research suggests that most of the problem behavior occurs in the first 30 minutes. So, you know, mm, if they, good to know. Yeah. That mm. first 30 minutes and most of that problem behavior, it'll start pretty soon after they leave. Um, but I, I agree with Sam of, of getting an idea of, of, um, 
you know, is there a time that you can be gone? Like maybe it starts five minutes after. So maybe you're okay for the first five minutes and you need to start building up from there. Or maybe it starts immediately or even before you leave the door, which means you have to start really early on in the sequence. Um, you might have a little bit more of an uphill battle because the dog can't tolerate any absence. But, you know, I think identifying whether it's a, a lack of enrichment, just like Sam was saying, that's going to be a different um, sort of treatment plan than a dog that is experiencing the anxiety and, and that shows like huge distressful behaviors every single time and never falls asleep is just, you know, kind of always, always on edge and always vigilant. Um, so, you know, the, the prognosis for those, I think is really different. Um, I think if we saw a dog with boredom, we're gonna, we're gonna think we've got a better chance at making some big progress um, with some maybe easier interventions than some of these anxious dogs. But, um, you know, it's, it's all very dog dependent and owner dependent and, um, you know, what, what they can do for training, um, what they can sort of suspend absences, um, all of that's going to factor into how, how well the treatment goes. Erica, you wrote a great point about something too. What? That fact that for some of these dogs, it can occur even before the, the human leaves the home. And, and so, you know, when I ask people to put, you know, to jot down what's going on, um, I want to know basically from the time they get up mm -hmm. until they go out the door, because they've created patterns and we know that dogs are incredible incredible at associating patterns and learning patterns <clears throat> so it, it becomes really important even from the time they wake up well you know i've got it well, i wake up at five you know 5 30 i'm feeding the dog i walk the dog i come home and then i start to get ready for work <clears throat> okay so when you get up in the morning and you feed the dog and walk the dog what's their behavior like now that you start to get ready for work, what happens? You're getting ready to go on a trip. What happens when you bring out the luggage before you're going to start packing? You know, those kind of things. It gives us a head start on, in defining a problem, but also in possibly creating some type of a strategy or a solution. I won't say solution, but a strategy to help change that fear, that anxiety that's there in the dog. Perfect. And so just... Just real quick, Erica, how can we tell, you know, what's an improvement? What are we looking for? So, you know, because again, a lot of times I think their try is so great. They have tried so hard to improve or please us or whatever it is. And we, we walk right past that. So, uh, you know, what, what can we look for? You know what? what hmm. I, yeah. And I think this is, um, you know, for separation related problem behavior, technology is really our friend. Um, it was much more challenging when, you know, you couldn't see what your dog was doing and, and you could just stand outside the door and listen for destruction or barking. But, you know, they might know that you're right there and not engage in it. Um, so, you know, usually we're looking for um, that that we can be alone, you know, leave them alone longer. Um, and really, we want to build up that that departure really in, in short time periods, like sometimes just by seconds uh, to try and build up their ability to, to stay home alone. And so we're looking for, um, uh, you know, a, a delay in when they engage in problem behavior and hopefully we train slowly enough that we never put them in the position again that they engage in it. Um, uh, you know, we all, you know, it's hard, it's hard to judge that. We'll make mistakes, but that's always our goal. Um, and that, that they recover faster as well. So if they do have a problem behavior that the next time we leave, the behavior hasn't fallen apart. Again, you've, you've still got some some training and some basics that they, that they have. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, so when, when we talked about the separation anxiety, yours, mine, and ours, and now we're gonna go on to mine because mine being, being the human, oh my gosh, and that is just, Okay, and I'm going to set us up for a question. So behaviors contributing factors that are mine, that are very human. And and I, I don't know who said it. I think you both did. And, and what I wrote down was out the door. How do we go out the door? Because I tell people all the time, and, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but it works for me. I tell my animals exactly where I'm going and when I'll be back. And oh my God, now we've gone with Erica from a German Shepherd to a black cat. I'm 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 in love. Okay, I'm 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 moving into your place. You've got everything I want. Black cat. Well, if, you, 
If the yeah. horse comes into the picture, though, oh, I, I'm I don't done. Know. She knows that. <laughs> you, you know that. Um, yeah, I'll bring I'll bring a horse or two if you need them. So, but but the thing is, for me, it's like out the door. And what I tell people is, I say, don't don't leave your house by you know by saying, oh no, I have to go to work. Oh, I'm going to miss you so much. Oh no, you know, and and whining about it and and just saying, oh, I really would like to stay home, and then leaving. No. Uh, so give us some tips. Give us some really good, solid tips that we can start doing today that are going to that's going to get us out the door or, as Sam said, on vacation. You know, when I pull out the suitcases and I, uh, you know, I've read a whole lot and I've had a lo whole lot of animals in my life. And I find telling the truth really works. It works very, very well. So Sam knows a couple of trailing horse things that I've done where. You know, my big, my half Clydesdale thoroughbred would not get in the trailer. I mean, would not, was not going to, we were there for hours and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, I just said, his name was Bubba. And I said, Bubba, we're just going to go down the hill. We're going to go ride with some friends. We'll be back at three o'clock. And as soon as I said three o'clock, he passed me getting into the trailer. So I, I really, I really believe in that. So I don't know either that or he was, you know, just as bored as I was standing on that ramp. However... Um, I, I really believe that. And I really believe that too, with, you know, when I would leave my dogs, there was, um, you know, a whole lot less, uh, to come home to <laughs> when I did tell them the truth. And I know you guys are laughing, you know, shoes pulled out garbage, you know, whatever. Um, and so, but please tell us about this, you know, what are, our, what is the human contributing factor that, that we can pay attention to and amend, please. Hey, doc. Yeah. Well, I, I think when you're saying tell the truth, uh, I view that as being predictable. And I think that helps these dogs um, if you're predictable that when I say this is going to happen, it's going to happen. So if I mm. say stay there and be good, they know that I'm leaving. But I've also hopefully done this enough with short separations that they also know that when I'm leaving, I'm coming back. Um, and so I, I agree. I think these dogs um, actually would benefit from being able to predict what's going to happen to them that, okay, Mom's going to be gone for four yeah. hours, but I'm going to come back. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I, I give credit to our animals that you don't have to be a great dog trainer as long as you're just consistent in what you say and what you do. And the animals really kind of fall into your um, into your life sequence. Um, and that's a credit to them. Um, but, you know, my, my parents are, are really lovely. They're not animal trainers. My, my mom's a pretty good trainer. My, my dad is um, undoes some of her work. Uh, but, but the, the most, uh, you know, I think one of the good things they usually do is they're consistent. And so even without explicit training, their animals figure out their patterns, just like Sam was saying, they're really good at figuring our patterns. So if you, if you can have patterns, that's going to help them a lot. Um, so they know what, what to predict. Um, there again, going back to some training lore, there was some lore that, oh, if you spoil your dog, you're going to increase the chances of separation related problem behavior and nothing like that has come out in the data. So let your dog sleep in your bed. You can feed them from the table, whatever you want. That's not going to be <laughs> contributing factors. You know, I think we need to just focus on the behaviors of absence that they don't know how to handle us being absent. And so we need to train them and teach them, um, you know, that we're going to come back and how, you know, what they, what behaviors they can engage in um, while we're gone. You know, it's funny, I, I find that um, I have more cases of this occurring in apartments, condos, and townhouses than I do in homes that have, say, a fenced-in backyard, and there's a doggy door or there's some type of uh, ability for the dog to, to meander outside, kind of watch the world, bark at the squirrels and the birds, go inside, lay on the couch, versus that confinement to a much smaller area less ability to move around and very much like with people who who are claustrophobic you know and, and needing space uh, there's less chance there's less opportunity for them to fi find a way of, of dealing with that separation um, but doc i mean consistency and it's one of the things we try to get across to all family members. I mean, we've got to all do the same things, you know. So for whoever it is, it's whoever it is, whether you're first out the door, last out the door, whatever. And I do with my guys. All right, guys, I'll see you later. I'm going to work, you know, that type of thing. Um, 
And then when they come home, you know, yeah, I'm happy to see them. They're happy to see me. Uh, but they, you know, they have, we've been lucky. I mean, they've gotten used to going, okay, oh, we're leaving again, <sighs> whatever. Oh, we're lucky. We have a fenced in backyard and a doggy door, you know, and I keep the cameras on. So during the day I can watch them, you know, rolling in the dirt, chasing each other around, you know, my, my retriever mix trying to find a squirrel that she can eat, um, you know, things like that. It, you know, I, it was funny because coming up this last night, I'm on, God, I hate it, but I was on Facebook on my business page and I see an ad come up solving separation anxiety in 28 days for your dog, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, we, we are the biggest contributing factor, you know, Tell generally me. speaking in all human and other species relationships, we are the biggest contributing factor to a breakdown or to a less than stellar partnership. Um, and the internet has not made that any better. Uh, you know, there's a million and one things out there telling people, I'll oh, do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that. Uh, so part of what, when I said before about creating a journal or, or a log or something is cataloging our own behaviors. You know, if you get up at this time, you know, what you know? What's your sequence for getting ready for work, for school, whatever it might be, or before you're going on a trip, whatever? Because that's it's it's already started. And what's even more interesting, and, and Doctor, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not sure there's any data to back this up. But being a a, a detection dog handler, I, it was interesting to watch my shepherd. <laughs> I tell people all the time, the the second you start thinking about, uh, I got to go get the luggage out. Everything about you at that moment changes, especially if you have a dog that has separation anxiety or distress or whatever the words are. Right? You, your body posture, the pheromones your body's putting off, your facial expressions, everything has just changed. And your dog is quick. And again, if this happens enough times and it doesn't take long, you know, two, three, whatever it is, they've got the pattern of, oh my God, they're leaving. Oh my God, they're going out the door. Oh my God, I can't handle this. And, and so, you know, it's changing everything from the way, the way we perceive it, the way we see it, the, what we're going to do, how we're going to think about it, all that kind of stuff. Because if we can start to get a handle on that, that's going to give us a, somewhat of an edge when it comes to working with the dog to help the dog see it as not such an anxiety driven uh, event. Am I off on that, Doc? No, I think you're exactly right. And and I think, um, you know, thinking always about what we want our dogs to handle, maybe they don't have to handle it now, but what we want them to be able to handle in the future is useful so we can start prepping them for that. Um, you know, it, it's, it's easy to say, well, my dog only goes to the vet, ideally, you know, once or twice a year. Uh, but if it's really stressful, we really ought to, you know, prepare them for that. Same thing for when we travel. Um, so I think thinking about all those things, how can I make it less stressful for them? So if you're gonna have a dog sitter, having the dog sitter come and spend a few hours with them, you know, pay them to come if you can half a day before you leave so they get used to this, oh, this person's around, um, my parents have gone to work, but then they came back and then that person left and that person was really nice. And so when that person is then over, you know, staying over at your house, the dog is more comfortable with them and more familiar. Same thing if you're gonna do boarding is, you know, take them there for an hour and bring them home, take them there for three hours, bring them home, let them know that they're going to go there, but they're always going to come home and then work, work your way up. And I think that's the same for departures too, is um, I suspect a lot of folks get their puppies or they adopt a new shelter dog and they do it around a time when they have a lot of time where they can spend with them. Right. And they never actually depart. And then one day they're gone for eight hours and the, and the dog understandably panics because they're not prepared for it. So, you know, I always tell people, as soon as you bring your dog home, let them settle in, but then go check your mail, go out and water the plants for a minute and come back in and just really get them used to the fact that you're going to leave through that door and you're going to be back um, and, and prep them from, you know, the first hours that you have them that this is going to happen. Perfect, 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 perfect. So what, what, what I wrote here is, um, 
strangers in strange situations. Strangers in strange situations. And I wrote down fires, floods, and isolation. And all of us in animal welfare, that's nothing new to us. But, um, you know, we're dealing maybe from the back, you know, from the isolation. And I think you've addressed a lot of that. But what about strangers and the strange situations? You said going to the vets only, you know, twice a year, but still, if it's stressful or something. And I, uh, again, I, I send out a newsletter a couple times a year now about, you know, what to, how to help during evacuations. And really fast, it's it's like literally, you know, if if you can do this safely uh, again, um, you know, I say take a washcloth or a hand towel, and you know, just go ahead and get a couple of your cells and and uh, you know, and so you know, you put that someplace safe. And horses too, horses, dogs, cats, just put it someplace safe where they can smell you, uh, you know, all these different small things. But but again, I think what you said too, it's about the introduction the predictability and the departure. So if I shove, you know, shove, literally, if I shove a dog into a crate and then just say, here you go, that's, wow, I know, right? But I mean, I, I know you guys and I too, you know, shelter work, crises, um, wow. And I've been there for all of the fires, floods, and isolation. So, well, um, you know, what's, what's happening right that? now? What? I mean, you've got, you've got the, the, you got the Calder fire out in California, you got the Dixie oh, fire, yeah. right? How many yeah. animals? And not just All canines. I mean, everything. Erica right? said she just we, had Ida, and, um, uh, and we had just had Ida down in yeah. the Wisconsin, Mississippi, et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, so we have animals being evacuated under mm -hmm. situations that are take the word traumatic to the nth degree for people, which therefore makes it that much worse for their companion animals. Mm -hmm. And. <clears throat> Yeah, we don't. We, we can't simulate floods and fires and tornadoes and hurricanes, mm -hmm. um, but we can, in some ways, simulate the stress that comes with that. Okay, how? What are you saying? Well, I mean, listen, we all have our stressors, right? We can work ourselves up into a pretty good lather about a million things in life, <laughs> and so whatever that might be, that's not I'd say a bad time to, you know. Let's get our harness on our animal, on our dog, and let's get them leashed up and get them into the car. And you, you know, you're talking to yourself, mumbling to yourself. You're you're mad at the world about whatever. It's a different kind of stress, but the dog's going. I don't know what this problem is, but you know what? It's and you get and you go out and you go for a 20 minute ride, and then by the time you come home, you know things are a little bit better. Or you go to somebody else's house, or not for nothing, if you can, you book a night in a pet free, pet friendly hotel. Right, because for a lot of times when you're evacuating, that's where you're going to end up. So go book a night where you take your pet, and you don't have to stay all night, you know. But the idea is getting them into that strange surrounding, you know, letting them hear the different noises, the car ride, whether you know it's on the first floor, second floor, whatever, um, you know. But turn it into something good, so then when that time comes, you know, just like for a small child, it becomes an adventure, it, and you know, instead of visiting you know the the scary movie perfect yeah perfect erica i can see you smiling now what, what do you have yeah i think the same thing of of prepping them making sure that even if you don't crate train at home or, or use the crate at home that they can comfortably go into a crate because in a crisis that's oftentimes you know might be where they have to go if you have to evacuate and they go to their own shelter same thing with wearing a muzzle you might not ever think your dog needs to wear a muzzle but it'd be great if, you know, if they're injured and they have to go to the vet, that if the vet has to put a muzzle on, it does, it's not an added stressor. So, you know, I think thinking ahead for sort of worst case scenarios and doing some things that are at least easy, um, that are fun training anyway uh, for your dog, it's just great enrichment to train them um, so that they're prepared for, for those things, I think is really useful. It's in times of those kind of disasters, and especially if you get separated from your pet, there's no way to, for them to understand. Heck, there's no way for us to understand. I mean, you know, it's one of those things that happens and, and we're not gonna have much control over that. But like the doctor said, getting them used to the muzzle in a crate is huge. And not just for catastrophes. I mean, just for going to the vet you know, or whatever it might be, the groomer sometimes, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> I work with a lot of dogs who 
are are fine at home but if they go to especially to a groomer or they're going to a vet where there's going to be an overnight procedure or whatever i mean they're absolute basket cases mm-hmm. you know, so mm-hmm. we try to get the groomers to work with us we try to get the vets to work with us you know so many of the dogs they go to a groomers and to them that's tough enough then they're put into some type of a kennel cage create whatever else maybe they're getting dried maybe they're waiting for their owner to come whatever and it's it's a really tough environment for many dogs you know and so we try to get groomers to to help us out you know what here when the owner goes there they're giving you a, a frozen kong uh something like that something that's uh, normal to the dog something that reminds them of home so that while they're there they got something to do maybe to take their mind off of the fact that when mom coming when's that coming when they coming to get me i really don't want to be here why do i have to be here you know that kind of thing same same with going to the vet i tell people you know if you if you've got it if you've got a veterinarian who loves you and wants your business you will be able to call them up and say hey look i'm going to be in the lobby in 20 minutes i just want to give a treat and leave so I, I, I really believe that that because, again, when we talk about that olfactory system, they, they, I believe they walk into a vet office, they can smell everything. They smell before everything. They walk in. Before huh? they walk before in. Before they walk in. Exactly. They can smell the procedure, the fears in the air. I, you know, and so, yeah, that's a real tough one. Uh, crating. I had a German shepherd who loved his crate. Absolutely loved it. Couldn't wait to get in there. And the smaller, the better. He loved his cave and he loved to be. Now my Jack Russell. Oh my gosh. You would have thought the neighbors would come over saying, oh no, what are you doing to that dog? And I go, I'm just, you know, crating him. Well, what I finally realized during an emergency, I put him together. You know, he, my shepherd did not smash my JRT, uh, but 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 then the Jack Russell was fine. And so, yeah, and, um, you know, and same with my cat. Same with my cat. I could have thrown my cat in there with him, um, and it would have been fine, seriously. So, um, but again, we need to try this at home first before an emergency, right? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on. So three, uh, are we are we complete on that? Do you think we kind of covered that one? The strangers and strange lands? Okay. Um, how to make our partnership the best. And this is this is Sam's word is partnership and we love it. There you are, baby. There you are. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Again, oh my gosh, for the for the radio audience that cannot see us but can hear us, this is fabulous. He's coming up really close. So Sam, I just asked you to make a point, but so tell us. So how to make our partnership the best? What well, give give us a few quickies. We're we're narrowing say, down on time and so yeah. please give us a You've few. You've heard quickies. me say this before. Don't well, be such a human. Oh, tell us what he right. means. You know, I say this all the time, don't be such a human. You know, take the time to see the world the way your dog does, to understand the value system that your dog, your cat, your kind of what your ferret, whatever it might be. Take the time to see and understand their world, understand their language, how they communicate. Right? That's a responsibility we have. That's not their responsibility. That's ours. That's our responsibility. It's our obligation to, to do those things. That way a partnership with equal respect, with effective communication between the two, with the understanding between the two. If you have a fearful animal, respecting the fear and understanding how to work with it. And, and have, you know, that's those things that in a partnership, whether it's a business partnership, a human to human relationship, whatever it's gonna be, you know, we want a partnership. You know, it's a 50-50 thing. You know, when they have a bad day, recognize it. You know, and if you're having a bad day, don't take it out on your dog. If your dog's having separation anxiety, you help it. You don't try to suppress it or get mad about it or, or whatever it's going to be. So don't be such a human. Okay? Your animals have to trust you. And, and Meg, you know me, my, my byline on my, my website, on my business, everything is build, build trust in order to teach skills. Then we can change behavior. And then both sides enjoy the partnership. Perfect. That is that is that is it. That is it. All, all right there in that in that one sentence. And so uh, we're talking the inner And I, I, I think I so love this thing about predict because uh, I know that I know that uh, Erica brought that up as well. The thing about predicting and, you know, I'm not going to get that on a YouTube channel. 
I'm just not. I, I'm not going to why. Right. I mean, but really, this is a little like, you know, printing off uh, symptoms and taking them to your doctor. You know, it doesn't, you know, listen to the doctor first. So here we go. Listen to the dog first. Watch them. Predict them. So, Erica, I can see you nodding and smiling. The thing about predicting is, for me, uh, you know, what, what comes next? So I'm getting a tail wag, I'm getting a body bend, I'm getting, you know, maybe a little bit of an ear down or what. But what comes next? Just watch them and enjoy them. They're better than YouTube. They're better than Netflix. Oh, my gosh. And that is how we learn. They teach us. They teach us their language, I believe. So, um, but, but please, uh, tell, us, tell us your take on that. Erica. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with, with Sam of, of recognizing, you know, that they have their own lives. They're living, I, I think about this every time I see one of my adorable cats and swoop in and pick it up and start carrying it around. And I think I, I, that wasn't part of their agenda for the day, right? I just kind of, uh, you know, interfered with what, what they had uh, in, in their lives. And so I have to recognize that if they bite me, then then that's right, you know, that I, I was interfering with their agenda. And um, I think so many trainers, especially on YouTube, can can make the human animal interaction confrontational and spin it as if the animal is being challenging and argumentative and trying to make your life hard and recognizing that it's not. It's trying to live its own life and it just <laughs> happens that it doesn't have the skills yet to do what you want it to do um, or you haven't made it worth its while to do what you want to do. Um, so I think, you know, recognizing that there are sentient animals with their own own lives going on and we oftentimes interfere um, and that they're not trying to make things hard for you. They, they're just struggling when we see dogs reacting on leash. They're not trying to be nuisances when they're destroying your favorite things while you're gone. Again, they're not trying to make your life hard. Um, and it's, it's up to us to help them live in our world and give them the skills that um, they need to, to, you know, live in our very complex and, and challenging society. I love what you said. I wrote it down. Um, not worth their while to do what you want them to do. Is that what you said? Oh my gosh, that is so up Sam's alley. But Sam is frozen now. He's frozen in a storm in North Carolina, even though he's from New Jersey. It's a long story, <laughs> but Sam is, Sam is now frozen in the rain. Can you see that, Erica? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. We love you, Sam. If we've lost contact, we love you. You've lost contact with the mothership. Where? <laughs> there he goes. Okay, so he's gone, but Erica and I are still here. So here, here we go. Here's the here's not my last banner, but second to the last banner, setting up for success, reaching our goals, and again, the partnership is our meaning mutual. I should have capitalized that, our, um, meaning the mutual, yours, mine, and ours. So, um, you know, what 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 quick do you have there? So I think for setting up for success, uh, we really need to be asking our animals questions, meaning, you know, when we ask them to do something, I view that as sort of a question, do you know how to do this, um, that they can answer. And if we haven't taught them the answer yet, it's unfair for us to punish them in any way or, um, you know, raise our criteria. We need to set our cri criteria so low that they're going to get it right. So if I'm working with a young horse and I want it to back up, I'm not going to expect that it can back up 10 feet straight. I'm going to ask it to just, you know, in, you know, maybe just engage its um, hind end a little to rock back. And I'll say, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. Um, and that way I don't have to escalate any of my um, signals or become more aversive to try and uh, get them to back up. And, you know, then when I ask them for you know, a larger behavior, they know what the answer is already. Um, I see that especially in the equine world. It's still in the dog world too, of asking the animal to do something. It, we haven't taught it how to do it yet. And then, you know, of course they're going to get frustrated. They're not going to access reinforcement. The trainer's, um, uh, technique is to escalate aversiveness to get them to do it and it just you know that's just going to ruin the whole partnership um they're going to view you as an aversive stimulus they still haven't learned what you wanted them to learn um when i when i talk to our students um a lot of them have to take organic chemistry which was one of my least favorite subjects as well and i said you know it'd be really unfair if they gave you a really complex organic chemistry uh question and then yelled at you when you didn't get it right if they haven't taught you all those little pieces beforehand. And, and I think 
oftentimes we tend to do that with our animals. I, you know, I think one of the most important things is shaping. Um, however you train, shaping is essential because that our learner is accessing a high rate of reinforcement if we're asking for small behaviors that they can get. Right. And I love that. And I think too, with the shaping, we need to know a little bit about anatomy, just a little bit. You know, anatomically, like if a word needs to back up, it's so much better, easier, et cetera, if, if their head is lower a little bit, you know, throat latches soften so that they can come back into their body and lean back. But anatomically, again, you know, their head is raised or what, you know, it's, what do you want me to do? Now I'm going to go into panic or flight mode. Now I need to get away from you. So anatomically, I think the same thing with a dog. Way cool, way cool. Nice, beautiful answer. Sam, hi. Sorry about that. We keep cutting in and out. I don't know what's going on. No, uh, that's okay. That's okay. So, yeah, so that's what we're talking about, you know, setting up for success, reaching our goals, which is, and Eric is saying, no, break think, it down. Um, if anybody ever gets a chance, a, year, a few years ago, Kathy Sadow put out a book, Plenty and Life is Free. Okay, and repeat that, please. Repeat her name and the book. Yeah, Kathy Sadow, S-D-A-O. Um, let's be, yeah. And uh, her book is Plenty and Life is Free. And it was really a, a, a breakthrough for, I know for myself, but for a lot of trainers, because it was like you said about capturing, right? If, if you're a dog, horse, cat, whatever, if, if they're giving you a behavior you like, make sure to acknowledge it. You know, mm. they don't have to work for everything. You know, if we tell somebody in our life we love them just because, you know, we felt the moment to say it. You can do the same thing with your dog or your cat or your, you know, whatever species you're working with, um, you know, and then between that and uh, Doc, I don't know if you're aware of the, the book, uh, stupid me, of course you are, uh, but Kim Brophy's book, Meet, uh, Meet Your Dog. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't you know, read it, but yeah, I know of it. Uh, it's pretty eye opening. Uh, it, you know, when Alexander Horowitz's book um, Inside of a Dog came out. You know, so many different things in there, and I recommend it all the time. And you know, the Pat McConnell's, uh, you know, the other end of the leash. You know, those kind of things. We, we need to get people to start reading or, or skimming or something, the the stuff that's in these books, because it, you know, in order for our animals to be successful, we need to be great teachers. Wow, that's it. You know, we're not we're not trainers. We're teachers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, words have a lot to do with it. You know me and words, and I, I'm really stickler about words. And you know, but we are teach. You know, people teach their children all the time how to to be uh, social, how to, to to do so many different things, how to be prepared for life. In it, well, why are we not teaching our dogs? know what why is this thing of oh i gotta you know i've got to be in control or i gotta this one no you want to have success be a teacher see their world recognize their world understand their world beautiful sam there's the intro to your book buddy there it is you just said it no, I'm gonna say, it. I, know, I know i know you just wrote that intro okay i, I get, I get I'm taking it I'll get Erica to help you write the book. There you go. Okay. All right. We have set up a partnership here. So here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. If I knew then what I know now, I would have. Erica? Uh, I, I have two of these. Um, so uh, growing up, I had a um, off-the-track thoroughbred um, mare who, I don't know why they sold her to a 10-year-old, uh, but they did. And <laughs> <laughs> she had cash in a trailer, but go on. Especially because we made it clear we wanted a trail horse and I was suckered in by the beauty. Um, and I look back on that and I think, you know, she was going to be a challenge any which way, but I wish I knew how to manage her better, how to, how to make going out on the trail feel safer for her and more reinforcing and, um, you know, knew to focus on the good behaviors and figure out what, what reinforcers um, I had for her. I could have done a lot better. Like I said, she'd have still been a challenge, but I'd have done better. Um, and then with my first German Shepherd, uh, you know, I feel like all my dogs can thank her for putting up with me when I was not as good a trainer and uh, teaching me how to be better. Um, so they can all all thank Miel for for 
you know, helping me through that. Um, and I, you know, then I wish I knew how to find good trainers because I didn't end up with a really horrible trainer, but there, you know, for a little, little bit there, I ended up with somebody that was like, don't, don't let her sleep in your bed. And like, you know, you have to eat first and maybe you should alpha roll her. And luckily I fell in with, uh, Catherine Horn, um, in, in, uh, Oakland for agility training. And she kind of steered me out of that, uh, which I was grateful for, you know, at that point, I was having um, unleashed reactivity issues with her and separation issues. And so, you know, um, uh, you know, I was trying to find help and didn't find good help. Um, and I, and I still wish this for other people. Like I felt like I was a, com a hugely committed owner. My whole life was built around um, my dog and yet I still made mistakes finding trainers. And so, uh, you know, I think that's hard for these folks that are, committed. Um, and I thought, you know, I was doing my research, but I, I, you know, I didn't know where to look or how to, um, assess a trainer. And I think that's really hard is that so many, um, really dangerous trainers pop up in some of these searches and people are trying to do right by their dog, uh, and end up, you know, harming their dog because they don't know how to find good trainers and all these bad trainers can practice with no, you know, um, no credentialing and, and no way for people to, to sort them from the others. Wonderful. Great. And you have a whole lot of advice in those stories, a whole <laughs> lot of advice. And one of, one of my takeaway is let them be the teacher. Let them be the teacher. And I loved what you said. All the dogs should be grateful to that one. And we all have that one, right? Okay, Sam, if I knew then what I know now, I would have... I would have understood what my dad was saying when he said to me things like, don't bother the dog when they're eating, let the dog alone when they're sleeping. Because as a kid, I didn't listen. I got bit more times than I could count. I never understood why. You know, I didn't appreciate um, that side of the dog. And if I knew now, if I knew then what I know now, Honestly, I would have gone into this profession a lot earlier. Mm. Mm. You know, uh, but the good thing was being a canine officer led me to this profession. So, you know, no regrets there. Oh my gosh, no regrets. And oh my gosh, to hear somebody say, I wish I would listen to my dad. Oh my gosh, that is just, that's awesome. That's awesome. And, you know, same with my family too, you know, my, you know, I had horses and dogs growing up and ducks and, you know, it just, you know, if I brought it home, they took care of it. So I'm really, I'm really, really grateful to, to all of that as well, as are my grandchildren. My grandchildren, you now my granddaughter rides like crazy. They have a pit bull. They've got a little, uh, what do we call her? A chihuahua, corgi chihuahua. So, I, oh yeah, oh yeah, she oh. is a hoot. So anyway, Erica, thank you so much for being with us today. Doctor, doctor, I hope you come back. <laughs> Thanks for having me. This is a lot of fun chatting with both of you. Oh my gosh. And wait till Sherry comes aboard. So we'll do this yeah. again for sure. Sam, you know, I love you, adore you. Yeah. And uh, we'll catch up on the, uh, in yeah. the future. Real Eric, soon. I'll be hopefully talking to you soon. Perfect. For our right. mutual acquaintances. That's right. I look forward Meg, to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Animals Inside Out brought to you by Blackwing Farms. If you know anyone who could benefit from today's episode, please consider sharing it. Also, if you want to learn more about Blackwing Farms and the incredible natural remedies for mental, physical, and emotional needs of animals, go to blackwingfarms.com and enter Animals Inside Out for 10% off your next purchase. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you.